fascinating, that fascinating indeed. <coughs> so my take away is um, that we, 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 we do live in a global village mm -hmm. uh, and it does no harm in, in, in studying the case studies that have worked in other parts of the world. But that is in no way a substitute uh, to diagnosing the issues at home and really uh, coming up with a suitable solution uh, to, to, towards your problem. Absolutely. In fact, let me, let, me, let, me, let me just maybe conclude by saying um, I've, just, I've just been through a course at Harvard University actually uh, on leading economic growth. And they, they, they emphasize this over and over. And I'm not saying so because I believe it because it's Harvard saying it. <laughs> but the alignment in terms of my own thinking and what they are now saying because they have stepped back also and did analysis of saying we have been trying to contest economic development thing for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Some countries have succeeded, some are stuck. And we have tried this solution, we have tried that solution, we have tried foreign direct investment, we have tried institutions, we have tried competitiveness, we have tried ease of doing business, we have tried all, we have tried trade, nothing is happening. Countries like Lesotho are still stuck. We have tried Agoa. They gave us a go. Say, look, tariff free, mm. quota free. If you manufacture it in the Sutu, it will enter US. What happened? Foreigners came and established here and make a killing. But Sutu are still in poverty. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this guy stepped back and said, what is wrong? What are we missing? And they've come up with a thesis. Right? But one of the things they emphasize is this issue of diagnosis, which I say dovetail very well with my own thinking because I can tell you here at RSL, part of, I think, the achievements was in the ability to create a, an ability by the organization to solve problems, to diagnose and solve problems. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you, you develop a, an ability, a capability that you actually can deploy to every problem. It becomes like going to the gym where you exercise your muscles and, and you are able to lift those heavy things in the gym, right? But it doesn't mean you can't leave this table right there also. You, can, you leave this table, you leave that chair, you leave that thing, which means the capability you have developed at the gym is helpful to you in other contexts. And what we did at RSL then, before even this exposure to this course I'm talking about, was problem solving, was deep dive and diagnosis of problems. You find the same, I think, realization and emphasis on that Harvard course I went, through, I went to. And they are talking this very issue of saying, they call it problem-driven iterative uh, adaptation where um, you start first by adopting and they, 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 they compare it with, with solution driven uh, uh, you know system where normally when consultants lend into the SOTU and they come to help us they will say yeah they will say you know what you know why you're not rich it's because you don't you, you, you don't implement uh, if this, I'm making an example. <laughs> Pre-package solutions and they dump in here. You, you need, you need, you need a, a civil service reform program. You need a, a, a this, right? And I tell you that the same script was played in Malawi last week. The same script will be played in Tuvalu, some island somewhere. The Solitan fees. <laughs> there is absolute, and they arrive one Sunday, one Monday morning, and they are out by Wednesday. <laughs> Right? <laughs> or when it's a consultant who comes and spends time, he, 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 he tends to just read your documents and speak to you guys and he'll give you a script of a document he's written somewhere. And, and sometimes they even make mistakes and you find in the same country they, they were adapting the document from, still mentioned in the document. So this idea of um, uh, adaptation is important and, and, and I was getting excited because what they are saying there in Harvard, they have a very interesting model. So they, they, they say um, a lot of the time you should also consider the fact that even in your context, you, you, have, you have what they call positive deviance cases, positive deviance, where mm -hmm. you find there is, even in your context, in your country, pockets of excellence where this thing is already working here. Hmm. Rather than bring a consultant from outside to tell you what to do or lend the Singapore example, the, the best global example we're talking about, an external example of Singapore, Rwanda, or Tanzania, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Look at pockets of excellence in your own country. There's a positive deviance, mm -hmm. something that actually is already working in our environment. The problem with 
a, an external sort of uh, example is that it is it, it, you can't just copy it. It is it works and it works for them. You can borrow, you can borrow certainly, and adapt here and there. But you are better off looking at positive cases of positive deviance, Concepts and then looking at your current your current practice, and then saying how can I borrow from this. I mean, they were making an example of when you are fighting malnutrition or, or, or diseases. You find there is a village where, for some reason, where kids all over the country are sick. This village kids are not are not sick. They're healthy. Mm. It's a positive deviance. Go study what that happens in that village. You might find there's a culture here that children should eat and eat well. Then copy it and replicate it all over the country. The, 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 the good thing with it is that it is happening, but happening already in your environment. So it's easy to copy elsewhere. Interesting. Um, here's a homework for, for you listeners and viewers at home. Uh, look for and identify positive deviances locally. Mm -hmm. and list them, just list one where we think despite our gloomy environment yeah. this is one bright spot uh, <clears throat> you touched on uh, RSL mm -hmm. which now uh, leads perfectly into my next question and the, the, the chapter in your life where you were at, mm. uh, at the helm of uh, <clears throat> our revenue collection service uh, 2017, 2018, you and the team there formulated and implemented the five-year strategic plan. Mm. Um, and uh, that plan was underpinned by the tag word Ria Aha, we are building. Mm. And as I understand it, the, the, the strategy, um, as I study it, uh, it hinged on maybe three main pillars, as I understand it, and mm -hmm. you obviously you, mm -hmm. you enlighten me more. Uh, one, <coughs> obviously the, the, the objective is to maximize the collection of revenue, but in a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. uh, so to achieve that, the strategy seeks to, one, deepen the culture of voluntary compliance, uh, it also wanted to uh, <coughs> improve or enhance the quality of the service of the institution itself. Mm -hmm. uh, it also aimed to reduce the cost of collection. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, can you take us back to uh, the thinking and the rationale and the discussions that went into formulating the strategy mm -hmm. and why at the time and maybe even now it was the right strategy for, for the institution. Mm -hmm. Look, that, that strategy was informed again I think by what I mentioned earlier, uh, an acknowledgement that we don't know. First and foremost, we don't know. We therefore need to take it in time and try and diagnose what the problem is. Because as uh, I came in back then, um, we, we, were, we, were, we were in a bad place in terms of I think, performance in the recent years uh, prior, uh, where performance was dipping and I'm talking about revenue collection, but also relationships with the stakeholders were not in a, in a very good place. And this was beginning to threaten even the sustainability of revenue collection. And we took a deep dive. From that perspective, that one, we don't know. Two, we were not coming with a solution-driven kind of approach where we say no all we need is this framework called whatever we're gonna implement this framework and it will work and magic for us and when we did that diagnosis together with a team it then emerged that what we had was more a leadership issue because I mean it's a knowledge management institution it's about people it's about uh, we don't we don't yeah it's about making sure that the people are one feeling inspired they're feeling empowered, they're feeling uh, able to do their work uh, because it's only when that happens that they can do their job and do it very well and then achieve the mandate of the organization. It then emerged that the problem then was um, what we call a poor leadership culture and that was defined by maybe a leadership that believed too much in authority mm. over uh, its ability to persuade and to motivate and to attract. It was more like a stick uh, rather than a carrot. You know what I'm saying? Um, leaders 
leadership is not, we, we acknowledge, it, it's, not, it's not so much authority, you know. You can have authority and you can instruct us to do something and maybe we'll do it. But I tell you, the proper leadership is when you get us to understand and buy into your vision and we do it not because we fear you, not because you are here, but because we know and understand where you are doing this thing and we know the right reasons for it. We have bought into the story, right? And we feel you are empowering us, you create a safe environment within which we can be our best. That's what a leader should do. And therefore we felt the leadership thinking was in the wrong direction where we needed to like reorient it. And the relationships were very toxic between management and the rest of the staff. Trust was at its lowest ebb. Trust between the agency and the clients being the taxpayers and traders was at its lowest ebb because it was again a cat and mouse kind of situation. We, 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 we were using the analogy of cops and robbers back then. And, mm. You know, the revenue authority so saw itself as a cop. You know, and we said, let us focus on building collaborative leadership mm -hmm. uh, 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 in order to bring about that voluntary compliance you talked about. But it starts with collaborative leadership, uh, uh, holding hands and mm -hmm. saying we're in it together. Mm -hmm. And this came really from, I think, a process that we adopted informed largely by a book I would recommend and always get have an opportunity to recommend it, I always do so. A Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, The Difference and Why It Matters by Richard Rumont. Good Strategy, Bad Strategy is there. It's there. I think I've seen it at uh, the bookshop at Pioneer Mall. Okay. Uh, uh, or exclusive books where I would recommend uh, or the soft copy downloaded wherever. Uh, it's a very good, I think, framework for strategy because it also to sort of put strategy on its head, you know, strategy to be vision, mission, and you know, a, a lot of that again, solution <laughs> frameworks where you attend a workshop and all you do is fill a flip chart and you walk away thinking we have a strategy, but you never apply it to your mind at any one particular point. So that is what we did, and I think, uh, as you say, that strategy was aimed at maximizing revenue collection, bringing about voluntary compliance back then. But we're also saying client centricity, improving the quality of service, but also the cost of collection. Because it's one thing to collect one rent for the Minister of Finance and then you take away 40 cents to run the revenue for the 40. You want to keep one cent, two cents of every rent or loot that you collect. Mm -hmm. So we, I think, um, um, did very well initially for that strategy. It seemed to work. Revenue collection increased, quality of service improved. Uh, we saw a turn in terms of relationship, people feeling now the need to fulfill their obligations mm -hmm. without any fear, uh, but rather seeing it as the right thing to do. But you know what? I talked about what the Harvard University are now talking about in this leading economic growth course I attended where they're talking about uh, problem-driven iterative adaptation, iterative adaptation. So mm -hmm. they say you iterate and keep adapting. Mm. Complex problems like that one of running a revenue authority is not complicated. There's no manual. You're on the right day one as a commissioner general and you're told, here's a manual. <laughs> <laughs> it's a complex problem. You learn as you go. It's doing learning by doing. Mm. And you therefore iterate and adapt. Iterate. Mm. The good example they give in this course is imagine people taking a trip. I'll change the example and say, taking a trip from Maseru to Johannesburg in 1800. There was no N1, there was, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. Imagine taking that trip. Nobody had done it actually in 1800. Compare with taking the same trip today. Now in 1800, Maseru to Johannesburg, uh, chances are you would be uh, uh, sort of, you know, on an adventure. Mm. You would be surprised to find a river when you go down here. Oh, there's a river. Caledon River, we now call it, we know it's there, you and I, because there's a map now. You'll be shocked because you have never been that way. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea of saying iterative adaptation says when you deal with complex problems like the journey from Maseru to Johannesburg in 1800 was, it was a complex problem. But the journey from here to Johannesburg now, it's not even a complicated problem. You know how GPS, it will tell you to turn and all that. Uh, okay, there's a manual. GPS, it will get you there a map. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's complicated, but it's easy one when you have the map. Because we still get lost, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> but in 1800, the same trip was a complex problem. Mm -hmm. You had to 
adapt as you go. Oh, there's a river. I thought I, I was gonna sleep by that mountain. Ah, we have to sleep here and figure out how we deal with this river now, right? And change tact. So the plan you had when you left Marseille Center would be different when you get down to the river. Mm -hmm. Once you cross the river, you move, oh God. You never knew there was this big mountain or this big valley, whatever it is. So you constantly are adapting. Sometimes you send people back home to go get some tool you thought you didn't need. So it's that continuous adaptation. Generation. It starts with humility. So what then happened is at the Revenue Authority, we started also moving away from voluntary compliance as we thought we were beginning to get. Uh, we then start thinking, how about <coughs> automatic sorry, compliance? Auto compliance. Why should I expect you to comply voluntarily? Why don't I make it so that you comply whether you like or not? It's automatic. If as you sit here, you're compliant already. In fact, you would need to do something active to get to become non-compliant. Whereas currently, you are non-compliant as you sit here. You have to literally stand up, go, queue, take a form, fill a form, or open a computer and be compliant. You see, there is therefore there is therefore that uh, what do you call it um, um, a constraint in your way towards compliance. And in this day and age of big data, this day and age of where in fact Google knows more about yourself than you can imagine mm. because it knows you are sitting here, it knows where you were, where you had lunch, it knows when you go to Johannesburg to a point of suggesting uh, it even knows you love pizza. Maybe. Scary. You know what I'm saying? You go to uh, your, your, your grocery store, they give you that loyalty card. Mm -hmm. You think they like you, they want to give you discounts. That's a data gathering too. Every time you buy, they swipe it. It takes the entire uh, basket of whatever you bought and stores it in their database. No wonder then when they have a discount on that shaving cream, you will get an email saying, oh, by the way, your favorite shaving cream is on discount. And you're like, oh, how do they know? <laughs> of course they know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it's because of the big data world we live in. Mm. Everything you do is a data point. And the, the, the world of business has awakened to that reality, mm. to a point that they gather data wherever they interact with you. Just to double click on data and the right. <coughs> We are now in 2023 and uh, now let's look back the past five years of the strategy and, and try to put some performance measures there. Mm -hmm. uh, what we, we set out to achieve uh -huh. and then um, how, how it turned out. How it turned out, yeah. Because mm -hmm. I know <clears throat> that uh, in that strategy, right. uh, the target or the, 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 one of the targets was to increase the, the revenue collection by 10% annually. Mm -hmm. And then um, the other target was to reduce the cost of collection from, I think, about 6% there yeah. to 3% uh, in 2023. How have we progressed to, towards those targets? I think, the, the, you know, one of the important achievements was in our ability to uh, exit revenue target, targets. Uh, collection targets. You know that I think out of the was it was it five five years or so I think we exceeded uh, uh, four or something like that. Um, and uh, that in itself I think is, is is the taste of of the pudding. As I say, it's in the eating really. But we really set out to say, let us not be too focused so much on the outcome that sometimes you give up before you reach what are called threshold effects. You know, when you're rolling a big stone up a hill and then you get almost there, but because you're not arrived, you give up and the stone rolls back. So our philosophy was always act on lead measures, lead indicators. I mean, it's like you trying to lose weight and hit the gym. What's important is not the level of intensity, it's about consistency, you know. You can go to the gym on Monday and exercise, kill yourself. Mm. Uh, tomorrow you stand on that scale, my brother, you're still the same. You're still the same. It's not a little bit <laughs> uh, But what tends to win is consistency. Mm -hmm. You know, consistency trumps intensity. So that's why I was saying to you, what we're trying to build is the capability of the organization to solve problems, no matter what the problems was at that particular point mm. in time. 
I think the way we have tended to approach strategy, again, it lacks humility. We tend to look back 10 years down the line and say, oh, 20 years down the line in 2000, so too in 2020 shall be a prosperous nation at peace with itself, with its neighbors. What do you know? <laughs> uh, what do you know about 20 years down the line? I mean, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Because you don't know that in 2008 there shall be a financial crisis. Mm. You don't know there shall be a COVID before you even know about it. When we reached 2020 itself, we thought it would be a prosperous, healthy nation. There will be COVID. Did you know you couldn't? So the idea of projecting forecasts, I don't care what model you have. You're mm. sophisticated, econometric models. And I can tell you, I, I'm an econometrician. I've been trained in those models. I know they just fool us. If you look at the projections of even central banks or uh, statistical organizations or uh, IMF or World Bank or name them about the trajectory of the economy for the next few years, they only have this few years for projection, right? They will mm -hmm. say, here's the data, <coughs> historical data, then they say forecasted for the next few years. And then they call the medium term uh, framework, the MTF thing, and you, you will see it going up. Right? For, it's, it's never going down. <laughs> Have you noticed? <laughs> and then compare that with reality. Mm. You will see a lot of projected upwards. Reality comes, it's a different story. And again, we project upwards, reality goes the other way around. So the message is that the idea of strategy is not so much about you pretending to be a magician and knowing mm. the future. We don't have a crystal ball. The best you can do is continuously adapt, continuously act on the lead measures, continuously hit the gym, exercise, eat well, do the right things, but please don't tell me that in two weeks time you shall be, you shall be weighing 52.78 kg, mm. which is what we do. Why, why, are you being, why, why are you being so special? Just tell me that I'm going to do the right things. Mm. I have an outcome which is to lose weight. You can have some sort of, a, I think, a general direction, but also be alert to the fact that reality, reality will throw some cat balls at you. And you can't model that. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes you say we have risk management. Risk management is not crystal ball. It's not, it's not, you don't know what it is. So black swans will come. A COVID will come. Mm. <laughs> Who would have thought COVID would come? Profound. Yeah. Very so what am I saying? Maybe let me complete my point. I'm okay. saying we achieved a lot in terms of revenue collection. We improved. We actually had uh, key performance indicators. We were measuring, for example, on trust, the trust, internal trust index in terms of our stuff. Mm. We're looking at even trust index uh, with our clients and we're doing surveys to be, moni to be monitoring that. I can tell you the indicators were going in the right direction. Despite mm. the fact that as we're starting um, to excite everybody, the strategic um, reality was that we need to restructure the organization. Immediately we started a restructuring exercise. It then plummeted staff. Uh, stuff what motivation because now people start saying oh my god we're gonna lose our jobs mm. and then so so this is now the adaptation that says if you set out to say I'm gonna hit that stuff motivation target no matter what you really are um, deluding yourself mm. yeah at best at best yeah <laughs> adapt along the way is the journey from Maseru to Johannesburg in 1800 be start with the humility to know that I may find a river I never expected. When I get to that river, I'm going to uh, change. But if I told you I'm going to arrive in Johannesburg, no matter what, on Sunday, mm. and then I come across a river, what do I do? Very fascinating. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> so our viewers and listeners, <laughs> uh, just bringing back to uh, our theme here, which is investment opportunities and growth and economic outlook locally uh, my take is we, we we have most of our challenges are complex challenges mm. we might have a few complicated ones but uh, i would argue most of them are complex and the key ingredient uh, to, towards facing or solving complex uh, issues that the recipe has nicely put it it's humility we, we need to uh, be humble. <laughs> Absolutely. Be humble. Learn as you uh, do. As you go. <laughs>
the difference is let, let's now move to 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 your new job now yes sir. Uh, at saku uh, <clears throat> when was the appointment and uh, just just speak to us about I think most of our viewers or listeners will know what Saku is. Mm. Maybe just speak to us about uh, what, what your role is going to be at Saku and uh, maybe just dovetail that with uh, what the broad objectives of Saku are and mm. how Lesotho being a member to Saku uh, benefits. Uh, and maybe, I'm not sure. If if you already have your targets and and, and, and plans and, uh, in your in your new role, maybe let's just share that with, with our viewers. Look, um, yeah, Saku is the South and African Customs Union, as you said, and, and and maybe for the benefit of the younger ones or those who don't know, um, um, a customs union really is a it's it's a it's, it's sort of like a club of countries. But it's based on rules, and the basic rules are, are that we, from a trade point of view, mm -hmm. uh, with the rest of the world, we, we will be coalescing and clubbing together and be seen as one entity when we trade with the rest of the world. So that if you are buying uh, a Mercedes Benz car from Germany and it enters any of this club, it will be subjected to the same treatment as mm. it would in any of the other member states. If it enters in Botswana, it will pay the same tariff rates uh, as it would if it enters Lesotho or Eswatini or Namibia mm -hmm. or South Africa, which, by the way, are the member states of the South and African Customs Union. It's five countries, Lesotho, Eswatini, Namibia, Botswana, South Africa. It's the oldest customs union in the world because it started in 1910 um, now that was like even before the last uh, COVID, <laughs> <laughs> the COVID before this one. Um, it is uh, has been working relentlessly the way it works is basically on that a common external tariff it is called and the tariff revenues are pooled and put in a revenue pool and shared every year by the member states mm. based on a formula uh, Lesotho's budget and, and Eswatini's budget are very dependent on that revenue, constituting sometimes 30%, mm. 40%, depending on the year, of the budget of the country. Yeah, the fiscal so budget, that is. I saw that uh, from the recent um, national budget speech, mm -hmm. I think we are expecting about 10 billion yeah. uh, from Circle. It's 10 billion. Very substantial. And it comes from 5 billion last year. Yeah. So it's like doubled almost. Mm -hmm. So, um, same in Eswatini. Eswatini also is getting other 12 billion. Uh, they, they, were, they, they come from 6 point something mm -hmm. last year. Uh, countries like Namibia get more. And Botswana, uh, then South Africa also get some. Yeah. This is the arrangement. Now, it's not just about revenue sharing. There's also an element of now policy development to bring about closer regional integration between the member states so that from a policy point of view, we start you know, speaking in one voice. Uh, industrialization, for example, is one of the areas where we say, let us have a collective industrialization mm. and policies and plans and strategies in our countries so that whatever happens in the sort of dovetails with what's happening in Botswana and what happens in South Africa so that you know the idea for the idea for example of regional value chains. There is also the issue of the negotiation of trade agreements where SACU when it negotiates with say the EU or it negotiates with India, or it negotiates a trade agreement to say, let us agree how much duties we shall charge each other for this water. Mm -hmm. How about for this microphone? How about for this table? Uh, Saku speaks as one. So we'll say, the Soto will speak for us, we'll be there sitting there behind you. You speak for us, we negotiate as one, which means we have to coordinate our story first, mm -hmm. and then go there and negotiate and speak for as one. Um, so there are a lot of trade agreements that have been signed by SACU. Um, mm. um, you have the European Free Trade Area called EFTA, 
countries that are in Europe but are not, that are not members of the European Union, countries like Norway, Sweden, Finland, Scandinavia, mm -hmm. we have a trade agreement with them. And if you want to sell anything there as an entrepreneur, go look at that agreement and see. You will find that you'll access that market very easily and cheaply. Uh, there are a lot of Namibia and, and Botswana beef going there. Yeah, um, we have a um, trade agreement with the uh, Mercosur countries, the Southern African countries, which is again an agreement one would invite people to have a look at. Uh, so um, um, uh, we are currently negotiating one with the UK. And mm -hmm. when I say we, I mean SACU, Same all five of us, because mm -hmm. we here is one <laughs> unit of <laughs> five countries. We are speaking with the UK. In this world, in fact, Mozambique has joined us. So it's SACU, we call it SACU and Mozambique on one side, negotiating with the UK on the other side, mm. a trade agreement. This is because UK exited the EU, so it no longer Exit. has an arrangement to trade with us, so we're negotiating a different arrangement with them. Uh, but now, so I'm saying one of the duties of the SACU, uh, uh, SACU uh, Customs Union is this issue of trade negotiations and speaking with one voice. Yeah. Then there is the other issue of the Africa uh, uh, Free Continental Area Agreement, mm. which is um, a new development, you know, high excitement in Africa, mm. with us seeing it as an opportunity to improve intra-Africa trade. Mm -hmm. You know, the problem with Africa is that we trade only with the rest of the world, more than we trade amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. A lot of our trade, in fact, largely in minerals. They come here, they go to pit, to port, mm -hmm. you know, extract the mineral at the pit, at the mine, transport it via a railway or a road to the port, out it goes, then it comes back as this laptop mm -hmm. because the same minerals have been used to now develop this laptop and then comes in and you consume it. We're trying to say, no, 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 let's pit to port thing, let's take the mineral from DRC, let it go to Zambia in order to then go to, to Tanzania to be turned into something else and then to Ghana and then come back to South Africa, let's go to whatever, so that there's intra-Africa trade. Great. Yeah, that's the biggest agenda now and mm. that I am now uh, having to drive as mm. part of the secretariat, as the, the leader of the secretariat of SACU. Another key part of it already that you realize is the need for trade facilitation and logistics. Because it's one thing to say we have signed an agreement, you can now send water to Ethiopia without duties. Well and good. Where is the road? Mm. Where, is, where is the railway? Where, where, where is the port? How is the port? You know, uh, how, am I getting that how do we deal with those potholes that are on that road? Yeah, it's mm. going to arrive there costing 10 times as much because it took forever to get there. Mm. You know, So trade facilitation in terms of in the customs procedures that we in place rules of origin, food uh, safety standards about this mm. water because I can tell you some people from another country will say, ah, how do we know that this water is free of disease, mm. that is purified and all that. Um, there has to be that ability for the Soto to develop its capability to test water, not just bottle it, mm. for, have labs that will test it to certify to the other guys according to an agreed framework that the water is clean. If you want to export chicken, similar system. If you want to send whatever it is, similar system. So, mm. trade facilitation and logistics is very, very important agenda item also. Uh, so that, that that's the strategy that I'm driving now in terms of the goals we really seek to achieve. There's also the institutions of SACU, uh, effectiveness of the institution is also becoming another objective. Mm. Yeah. So that is what I'm, <coughs> I'm, I'm tasked with, and um, in terms of targets, really, those are my targets. I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> maybe let's just turn it down a bit uh, and speak about uh, if you were to make an investment case for Lesotho, mm. just in under a minute or a minute mm. and a half, <laughs> uh, how would you sell Lesotho? So you, in many cases. Mm -hmm. had the opportunity to, to, to sell a Lesotho mm -hmm. economic story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look, Lesotho has one great advantage. For me, it is, at least from a trading of uh, goods, 
and I'll say perhaps even to say this is our proximity to port is a great advantage because uh, I'll tell you that most investors among the things that they look at is always the ease of doing uh, of trading at least moving whatever it is that they produce and the cost of doing so mm. um, so our proximity to port and I'm talking about um, um, even the infrastructure that connects us in terms of us being inside a country that has relatively more advanced infrastructure, infrastructure such as South Africa, their airport, their road network, although beginning to take a bit of a toll lately, but mm -hmm. you will agree that the N3, the N1 and a lot of other roads here are good arteries that connect us to Durban, to PE, uh, but you also have the major international airport or Tambo in this sub-region being so proximate to us. Mm -hmm. That presents a great opportunity, although I do feel that we can actually build more on that by improving our connectivity to that, to those who have our own airport here that take us to become a competitor to that airport sitting in Johannesburg, but also um, connectivity through even a highway that can connect Bloemfontein and Durban through Lesotho. Um, and we're looking at it being feasible by including Bloemfontein, so they know just Lesotho. You know, looking at Central South Africa and connecting to the N1 coming from Cape Town up. Uh, 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 that would be a business case. So a business case for Lesotho really boils down to that. I don't like this idea of selling Lesotho as a low-cost uh, market from uh, uh, cheap labor. Investors, it depends. I mean, you, you, you attract what you you set out to achieve. You attract mm -hmm. people who are looking for cheap labor, you'll find them. You'll find them. But they are not going to produce high-value-added products and services that can then unlock development. Mm -hmm. You know, we should be not focusing so much on cost of labor, but the productivity of the labor. Mm -hmm. How much does an hour of work in the suit to produce in terms of value? And for mm -hmm. that to happen, you need people who are well-trained, mm -hmm. people who have skills and know-how, who can then be very productive. And I can tell you, any investor will go to a place where people are productive. But high productivity, high income. Mm -hmm. But no, no producer will complain because they will say, you produced, I'm paying you for what you've produced. Okay. But if you keep low productivity, low-wage jobs, that's what you will get and you will never develop. But Lesotho stands and has an opportunity to uh, uh, build that, uh, I think, um, uh, uh, advantage. Mm -hmm. We have developed some sort of know-how in textiles, which we can use to then start spreading and moving into higher value chain, higher value added items, either in textiles or related industries like the manufacturing of uh, uh, chairs, or what do you call it, seats, car seats. Mm -hmm. uh, for the likes of BMW, Mercedes, the skill set is the same. You can now start wondering about suits like this, Italian suits, until they are called the suit suits. Mm -hmm. uh, because the skill, the know-how, it's already there. So you're branching away from what you know to move into that which is nearby. Uh, to, to basically, uh, for me, that's a business case. And I'm saying for anybody who comes here, don't look necessarily at what we're currently doing. Look at our potential. Renewable energy. Renewable energy um, is one great opportunity. Um, hydrogen energy apparently is highly water uh, uh, sort of, you know, intensive and we have water and mm. it's a renewable energy. Then you can produce the energy here, get producers of high energy intensive uh, products such as aluminium to mm. come and operate here near the production of the hydropower or the hydrogen energy. Then you start now producing green aluminium green steel which commands a premium in the market for me there's a business case it revolves around our natural uh, human resource capacity and also our natural endowment but being smart enough not to just sell it cheaply but to add value to it mm -hmm. and then command a premium in terms of how much it gets that's how you develop very interesting thing mm -hmm. uh, if a uh, 20 year old old self if he, if that person was sitting across the table, uh, what advice in terms of career and profession would you give to that 
and mm -hmm. knowing what you know now, having achieved what you have achieved. Mm -hmm. <coughs> In, in just in, uh, a minute, <laughs> what do you say to that? Well, to be honest with you, I advise them to to not be scripted, to shun being scripted, because I'll tell you, a lot of us um, during our era, we're probably the last generation or one of the last generations where we followed a script to the letter, where we're told, go to school, get good grades, get a good job, and you'll be successful. Mm -hmm. And some of us still believe in that even today. I saw what was supposed to be a joke in WhatsApp group of my friends. Someone sent um, some of this, you know, chain, uh, whatever, messages, uh, which shows some guy who supposedly has just written an exam and he gets a feedback from the teacher and uh, it says, I think you should try the car wash business. So we're supposed to laugh, obviously, because it says you're flunked. You're so hopeless that... Mm -hmm. School is not for you. Go try car wash business. And then we're supposed to laugh. And I'm thinking, no, there's nothing funny about that. People are billionaires running a car wash business. Why should we think you run a car wash business because you're a failure? You see, that narrative, the fact that we find that funny, says something about how scripted we are. And I'm talking about me and my generation. We're so scripted. Mm -hmm. So if I were to talk to my 20-year-old now, and I do say so to my sons who incidentally are approaching that age, to say, guys, don't be scripted. Go to school, learn, but never think anybody owes you a job out there. Start thinking about you creating value. Start thinking about you actually uh, owning, um, uh, creating an asset. Mm. You know, out of yourself, so that you then can monetize it. That's how you're going to end a living. This idea of depending on employment is mm. gone and gone for good. That's the advice I would give myself because I think we missed out a lot. Stop being scripted, guys. Flip yeah. the script or just throw it away completely. Throw it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and just maybe lastly, um, can you share with us what you are currently reading or listening mm. to? What I'm, reading, I'm currently reading Simon Sinek on leadership. Mm. I found him so fascinating. Mm. I would recommend anybody to read him. Um, he, has, he has written uh, Start With Why. Um, there's also Leaders Eat Last. There's also The Infinite Game. Mm -hmm. um, those are his books. Watch his videos. Uh, this guy, videos. Yeah, this guy has one of, I think, the record-breaking YouTube videos where he delivered a speech about leadership and it, 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 it broke the internet <laughs> as you as well as <laughs> it went viral so simon sinek is my current reading and when i read a, an author i read and reread and mm. find uh, anything that he has written uh, i recently <coughs> was on um, um uh what's his name this guy of the black swan um, um the name is escaping me and that normally happens at this time of the day so <laughs> yeah so i'm on <laughs> simon sinek and 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 very happy um uh, and would recommend anybody to, to read on. His, his views on leadership are amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of which is, uh, you know, leaders should realize that you are not responsible for anything. You are not responsible for the job. You are responsible for the people who do the job. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and the moment you realize that, a light switch comes on just uh, in, your, in your head because you start realizing that just create a conducive environment for people to work, support them, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, create that circle of safety um, and be there to empathize and they will deliver for you. Yours is not to get your hands dirty because the moment you do that, who is providing the leadership? And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the bar has been set. <laughs> uh, this has been very sharp. This has been very uh, fascinating. Clinic and uh, Thank you, punchy, mm. brilliant, uh, and overall very insightful. Um, we thank you, Daddy, for mm. again stopping by and having a chat with us. Mm. Uh, we wish you well in your new role and uh, continue making Basutu proud. Thank you, Mazala. That brings us to the end of episode one of uh, Lesotho's Investment Case podcast. Uh, do remember that you can catch us uh, on Lesotho's Tribune website uh, as well as Lesotho Tribune uh, social media uh, platforms that's on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, until the next episode, 
Cheers, everybody. Bye.